Hello, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome, or good morning, or good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Raffaello Pantucci. I am a senior associate fellow at RUSI, and I'm delighted uh, to welcome you to this fifth in our series of military. You're live, Raffaello. Um, Sorry, I'm just getting a very strange echo down the line here. So I'm um, uh, mid. So I'll, I'll it's continue. All clear sorry, on our I'm end. getting it. Okay, I'm getting a. I'm getting an echo with a long delay on the line at my end. So I apologize in advance for this. Anyway, I'm uh, welcome to the fifth in our series of uh, the military history program events. Um, this uh, particular event is about the Malayan emergency. Jared Templer's role and his legacy. Um, and I'm delighted to be joined for this event uh, by two wonderful speakers um, who are also actually colleagues of mine out here in Singapore um, at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies, where I am a senior fellow. And our two speakers today, Dr. Kumar Ramakrishna and Dr. Ong Wei Chong, uh, are both uh, experts based at the school Dr. Ramakrishna is an associate professor and provost chair in the National Security Studies and associate dean in terms of poli in charge of policy studies, as well as head of the International Center for the Study of Political Violence and Terrorism Research. And crucially for today's session is also author of Emergency Propaganda, The Winning of Malaysian Hearts and Minds, 1948 to 1958. And Dr. Ong Wei Chong, who is an assistant professor and head of the National Security Studies Program at RSIS, um, and also crucially for today's session, is the author of a book called Malaysia's Defeat of Armed Communism, The Second Emergency, 1968 to 1989. Um, and our two colleagues will talk today about the Malaysian emergency, and specifically uh, Sir General Temp Gerald Templer's crucial role in this. Now, of course, this is a subject which is now consigned to history, but has a lot of salience still today, both in terms of the lessons uh, that have been learned from the particular Malaysian experience, but also in terms of uh, the experience of conflicts in South Asia and history and how it still plays an important role today. Uh, this is something that we saw recently in some of the declassified records that were uncovered uh, in the British press about what had been done by the British forces in Indonesia, also in counter-communist forces. So it's a very live and interesting subject, and I'm delighted to be joined by these excellent two colleagues to talk about it today. The order of today's event will be that Dr. Uh, Ramakrishna will start us off um, talking for, I think, about 20 minutes or so, um, and then we'll hand it over to Dr. Ong. Um, but throughout, I would encourage our audience to please feed in questions into the Q&A function, um, and I will collect them and then I'll put them to our two speakers at the end. So without further ado, let me hand it over to Kumar, please. Uh, thanks uh, very much, Raf, and uh, hello colleagues. Uh, very happy to be here. Let me just uh, try to share my screen. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I'm here to talk about uh, the role of a uh, General uh, Sir Gerald Templer, who was uh, the uh, both the Director of Emergency Operations and uh, High Commissioner uh, in Malaya from 1952 to 54, and I've titled my talk uh, "British Propaganda During the Malayan Emergency: The Impact of General Templer." And uh, emphasis on propaganda is something which uh, I hope will become uh, apparent as I proceed. So, in the time available, I want to examine how the propaganda war in Malaya was eventually waged effectively. It wasn't something which began, it wasn't really uh, very effective at the start, but eventually I would argue it was. Of course, we want to understand the impact of General Sir Gerald Templer. And as Raf uh, suggested, we'll try to sort of like uh, unearth uh, what I would consider uh, enduring general lessons for counterinsurgency today. Um, the perspective I uh, have is that of an academic historian. I'm uh, not an army police veteran with experience of emergency. If anybody here is, I'll be happy to hear from, from you. So just uh, to scene set, right, <clears throat> the emergency, of course, refers to the post-World War II campaign uh, 
waged by the British colonial government and uh, from 1955 onwards and particularly after Malayan independence in 1957, the independent Malayan government against the MRLA. MRLA stands for the Malayan Racers Liberation Army, which is essentially as what historian of the emergency, uh, Anthony Short suggested was the Communist Party of Malaya in battle dress. So the MRLA uh, evolved from the wartime Empaja, which was the Malayan People's Anti-Japanese Army that had operated with uh, Force 136 during the Japanese occupation of Malaya. And of course, those of you who have read uh, you know, The Jungle uh, is Neutral by Spencer Chapman would uh, be familiar with Force 136. So the MRLA uh, for, sought through force of arms to get rid of the British from Malaya and set up a communist republic of Malaya based on the Maoist model. In fact, many uh, CPM MRLA members had strong emotional connections with the CCP in China, Communist uh, Party of China. At its peak of terrorist activity in 1951, the MRLA had about 8,000 men under arms, supported by a 50,000 strong logistics network scattered around the, the, the western part of Malaya. Uh, this this uh, support network was called the Min Yuan, right? And the, the Min Yuan, the support network, was drawn largely from the rural Chinese community, the timber workers, squatter farmers, rubber estate workers, tin miners. In my view, these guys were the key constituency in relation to the shooting war, the jungle war in Malaya. The early British approach to the outbreak of the communist insurrection in June 1948 was essentially coercion, right? So uh, there was a massive and rapid buildup of security force strength Certainly by the early 1950s, uh, the peak of the, by the mid 50s, we had 23 British and Commonwealth Army battalions, uh, 60,000 police, 250,000 home guards, right? And from essentially from 1948 to 52, before the arrival of General Templar, uh, a hardline approach was adopted. And this was uh, expressed through very strong emergency regulations, such as the forced resettlement of rural Chinese from the exposed jungle fringes to the defended but rather ill-equipped resettlement areas, mass detentions and deportations of rural Chinese communities who were deemed guilty of cooperating with the communists at the same time, not cooperating with authorities, and uh, uh, collective punishment and fines on villages suspected of colluding with the communists. So why this hard line? Well, two key reasons, essentially. Number one was British imperial policing habits. Uh, many historians have talked about the so-called uh, Irish model of policing, which originated in the British imperial context, where essentially the, col the colonial office in London had only so much manpower and, and they had to manage uh, uh, far-flung colonies. So there was a need to uh, impose uh, a model which would uh, command uh, respect and, uh, and, well, even fear, right? Key senior imperial police officers uh, came from the 1920s, well, they had that uh, cut their teeth in the 1920s paramilitary uh, Royal Irish Constabulary in Northern Ireland. It was a no-nonsense policing approach. Uh, many of the imperial police uh, were recruited from the military and they had a military mindset. Uh, they, they essentially didn't really emphasize cultural affinity of the population to be policed. So this Irish, so-called Irish model was transmitted through personnel transfers throughout the empire. Uh, when the uh, Palest uh, British mandate in Palestine was on, uh, many of these uh, officers went there. And when the mandate ended in 1948, many of them were transferred to Malaya as well. So the, the other element was uh, the attitude towards the rural Chinese. In fact, if you go at, look at the records, the rural Chinese at the state of emergency, certainly within this period, 1948 to 52, they were quite terrified of the police. Essentially, uh, they were European officers. And the rank and file were not ethnic Chinese, they were largely Malay, ethnic Malay. And one of the big challenges was uh, not just the police, uh, Malay police rank and file, but many of these guys uh, were ill-trained because of the start of the emergency, there was a need for a great demand for uh, security forces. So so-called special constables were hastily set up, but they had very little training, they were ill-disciplined and they didn't really perform well. So another key factor, uh, which affected the uh, British colonial uh, approach to the rural Chinese constituency was there was, uh, when uh, in the 19th century, there was this entity set up called the Chinese Protectorate, 
which was supposed to be the represent the colonial government's finger on the pulse of the Chinese community. Well, this very important uh, Chinese uh, protectorate institution, where essentially the European officers could actually speak in the local Chinese dialects, this was abolished after World War II. So there was this essentially significant, very important communications vacuum between uh, the, the ruling uh, authorities on the ground and the rural Chinese community. And so there was this, in, 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 under the pressure of the emergency, there was this default assumption by many non-Chinese speaking European officers that, well, you know, you can't really trust the Euro European, I mean, the, uh, the Chinese, because essentially the CCP, at that, uh, the CPM at that time was a largely Chinese entity, right? And there was this other uh, element, which I saw in the documents, uh, well, you know, the, which was essentially even at pretty uh, high levels in, in Kuala Lumpur, you know, the, the Chinese were said to have a, the rural Chinese were said to have a secret society complex and thus you had to employ the strong hand to keep them in line. And this was reflected in the emergency regulations, which were quite draconian. Thousands were detained, deported to China. There were collective fines, 22 hour curfews. And the result, relatively unsurprisingly, was mass rural Chinese alienation. So, I mean, if you cast your minds back to uh, what the typical interrogation looked like in the early 50s or well, late 40s, early 50s, a rural Chinese person being interrogated, European officer, Malay rank and file, it wasn't a recipe for success. Well, so what was Templar's role? He came, he arrived, right, sent by, appointed by uh, Prime Minister Churchill, he arrived in February 1952, 70 years ago. He was appointed both the High Commissioner and Director of Emergency Operations. Templar also brought with him Commissioner, Commissioner Arthur Young from the City of London Police. And one of the things Arthur Young, uh, Templar's Commissioner of Police did, which was very important, was he, he tried to get the Malayan police away from a, paramilitary, a largely paramilitary orientation to a more community policing style, right? And so Young used to go around saying, the police must be part of the people and people part of the police. Right, so you can get the idea of what he was trying to achieve, right? Uh, reorientation, of, uh, a mental re reorientation of the police. And to this end, with Templar's support, Young launched a massive retraining program on the rank and file police and the special constables, the much maligned special constables. He also sent uh, the, the European police officers to uh, the government officers' language school in Cameron Highlands. Those of you who have been to Malaysia will know what I'm talking about. Uh, so in the Cameron Highlands uh, G, uh, government officers' language school, uh, European officers were learned uh, Cantonese, Hokkien, Amoy, and all these dialects. Uh, in fact, uh, it, it was uh, a study done by the Operational Research Section in the 1950s found that the, when the rural Chinese uh, encountered uh, either uh, district officers, European district officers or police talking to them in the dialect was actually a, a, a very important way of winning their trust, right? Another important uh, element about program or campaign which uh, Arthur Young launched was Operation Service, launched at the end of 1952. And the slogan uh, was the police must be the friend of the public. When, when Operation Service was launched, uh, many people at the, on the ground at the time thought it was just a PR gimmick, but many more knowledgeable observers after a couple of years realized that, you know, actually it was very important because at the time the, the, image, the image of the police with the rural Chinese community was very bad was very poor. So any attempt to sort of improve that image was bound to have some sort of a positive effect. It wasn't an overnight thing, but essentially by the end of 1954, early 1955, it was obvious that the rural Chinese were slowly turning uh, their, around in terms of their attitude towards the police and the government. Uh, and this was something which was very positive. So Templar, was somebody who he was almost like was going around campaigning, right? He met people from all walks of life and he made sure that he was very, very visible. But the visibility was actually very important. So what was Templar's secret? So this is where the, my uh, uh, focus on propaganda comes in. I think Templar displayed a very nuanced understanding of propaganda. Now, if you look at the, the, the textbooks, right, propaganda, most people would say that refers to any planned uh, mass communications that, uh, that is able to influence the thinking and behavior of a target audience. What I uh, would argue is that 
Propaganda actually is, refers to any relevant mass communications that influence the thinking and behavior of a target audience. So mass communication is not just your words. It's also your policies, your actions on the ground, right? So in Malaya, if you talk about propaganda of words, right? Well, much was done. You know, there was a lot of it done for sure. There were speeches made by surrendered enemy personnel or SEP, Radio Malaya, uh, put out lots of uh, uh, broadcasts. There was a particular uh, a service called the Community Listening Service, which was very uh, uh, popular with the uh, rural Chinese in the villages, in the, uh, in the rural areas. Uh, the Mobile Film Unit, the Tom Hodge uh, won awards. They produced lots of short documentaries, uh, which talked about uh, life in uh, Malaya and uh, particularly life for uh, SEP that surrendered and you know, the, the new life they had, right? Of course, leaflets were dropped. Millions of leaflets were dropped by uh, patrols and aircraft. The voice aircraft, uh, we used to fly around part, parts of the jungle and brought and uh, you know, where they had SEP broadcasting to uh, you know, particular uh, ex-colleagues right, who were still with the MR, MRLA in the jungle. That was also pretty effective. The, so in terms of propaganda of words, conventional propaganda of words, there was a lot done. But also there were much that was done on, uh, on uh, propaganda of deeds. So, so we have to analyze this more. What do I mean? In Malaya, you see, the, the, be, before Templar came, right? In Malaya, all these things I'm gonna show you now were what I would call negative propaganda of the deeds. Right, to the rural Chinese community, where the essential message of all these things was, we are not your friend. Poor policy, right? Uh, the ER, the emergency regulations, mass detentions, deportations, collective punishment, forced resettlements in the poorly developed resettlement areas early on, alienated the rural Chinese. Overly harsh, unprofessional security force behavior towards rural Chinese was also uh, negative propaganda of the deed. In fact, the operational research section did a study of why young Chinese uh, joined the uh, MRLA in 1948-49. It was not because of communism. I mean, these guys didn't even understand what communist ideology was, but essentially they found, Operation Research Section found the fear of the police was the key driver why these Chinese, young Chinese joined the communists, right? They didn't love the communists, they didn't love communist ideology. They wanted to get away from the police and this was in the records, right? The other thing was large scale military operations at the start of the emergency aerial bombing sorties, they weren't very effective, right? Uh, these created collateral damage amongst not just uh, the MRLA, but also civilians, right? And in fact, the MRLA, uh, SEP, when they were interviewed, they were asked, right? So what do you think about the bombing? Were you scared? They said, no, it was actually battle inoculation. What they were scared of was the brand gun, right? For some reason. And uh, SOVF, which was a Special Operations Volunteer Force, which was set up made up of surrendered SCP, uh, ex uh, guerrillas who were sent back into the jungle to hunt for the CPM. So this was, this was more effective, right? No, uh, Sir Robert Thompson, who was actually a very key player in emergency, also wrote uh, the classic uh, Defeating Communist Insurgency. Uh, he put it well, right? He summarized the, uh, the, the problem with mass bombing, right? Uh, uh, aerial bombing, right? Uh, one bomb that misses its target and kills a child will create a thousand new enemies. So, and this is uh, something which uh, was emphasized, minimum force. Minimum force uh, was very, very important. So conversely, right, I just told you about negative propaganda, deed, but when Templar came, right, the, the following represented positive propaganda of the deed to the rural Chinese, where the message was, right, we are your friend, we are your friend. So Templar, he seized the hugely, by 1953, he seized the hugely unpopular mass detention and deportation policy. He ended collective punishment where whole villages were put under 22 hour curfew. They deemed to be not cooperating, right? So that was abolished. And importantly, the resettlement areas, more thought was put into these areas to make them better guarded, well sited next to, uh, say, a bigger town. So there are economic opportunities and they're well equipped yet, uh, the water and all those amenities. And importantly, Templar changed the name. He said, don't call them resettlement areas, call them new villages. So Templar was very sensitive to these sorts of things. And the other important policy which uh, he introduced in September 1953, 
was the uh, creation of so-called white areas where all the emergency regulations were, were removed. So emergency regulations were very draconian. I mean, you had your rice, you, you couldn't eat normally, you couldn't go out to work uh, anytime you want. They were, it was very, very uh, uh, unpleasant, right? There were so much restrictions on your movement, on how much you could eat, right? And it was, it was pretty repressive. So when the white area started in 753, ordinary people could move around freely and live normally without emergency uh, restrictions. This was started in Malacca, the uh, settlement of Malacca, 953. And when the people in the adjoining districts saw how the white area was, they also wanted it, as, they wanted these white area freedoms as well. And so they cooperated with the authorities. So this was clever, right? Uh, the other thing that was uh, positive, that like constituted positive propaganda of the deeds was improved police training and PR campaigns to really try to turn the Malayan police from a largely paramilitary force into a community policing service as well. As mentioned, Templar worked with uh, Arthur Young on this. And another important innovation was civics courses in which government brought busloads of ordinary rural folk to the urban centers to see at close hand how the government could actually help uh, the rural Chinese live their lives and humanize the police and district officials in the eyes of the ordinary folks, right? And this was important because the communist propaganda was telling uh, the rural Chinese that if you go anywhere near the government, you'll be killed, right? Or, you know, you won't be treated, you'll be treated harshly. And the other thing is, we see that picture, right? Templar, he, uh, he was the uh, well, director of emergency operations, but uh, he was also high commissioner. And technically, it was a civilian appointment. He didn't have to go around dressed like that, but he wanted to project power, right? So it was like, again, like I said, I mean, he was very sensitive to these sorts of things, right? The, the, uh, if, he, if he dressed up as Tuan governor, right? I mean, he would be able to project confidence and project power and assure uh, ordinary people. Okay, at this point, I will stop sharing and I'll ask uh, Connor, could you just uh, share the uh, video? Thanks. Journey. Making his first train journey in Malaya, the High Commissioner, General Sir Gerald Templer, was accompanied by his wife on his recent tour of Johor. The journey took them past rubber estates and through jungle areas, and 20 villages, some of the new ones, were visited. Malay communities turned out to offer a welcome, and the General also talked with many Chinese villagers. At one halt, Sir Gerald and Lady Templar each agreed to plant a tree to commemorate the occasion. The two-day tour is reported to have proved a popular success. Good news from Malaya, where half a dozen bandits, five of them... Right, so I'm back. Okay, uh, thanks very much. So you get a sense of what uh, Templar uh, was doing when he was on the ground in Malaya. Right. So Templar did a lot on his own, but he also had able lieutenants, and one of them was Arthur Young, the Commissioner of Police. If you go to the Imperial War Museum at Lambeth, right, uh, there'll be a document there which uh, was essentially is was essentially Arthur Young's uh, manuscript. I don't think he ever published it. It, was very, it makes a very interesting reading, and, and he's laid out his philosophy of, of policing. So what Young said was that in policing, minimum force was the key, and the whole idea was to behave well, calibrate the use of force, why? So as to be able to win public confidence and spark intelligence flow on the cities, the communist terrorists. And Young also said that, well, in this kind of a civil emergency, right, the police, not the military, should be the, well, the term they like to use, a sharp end or the stick in policing the community. And Young made an interesting comparison between these, uh, well, the military and the police, right? He was saying that the problem was that in order to get information on the CTs, i.e. the communist terrorists, the soldiers and paramilitary police tended to use harsh interrogation methods and impose curfews that generated resentment. So Young was saying that, look, if you want the people to cooperate with you, you can't behave like that. You, know, you, you need to be able to show them that government is your friend, right? So he wanted more of a friendly neighborhood, Bobby on the beat model rather than paramilitary police, no different from the regular army, 
And in fact, and interestingly, Young was said that soldiers were trained to make up minds fast so as to act quickly. And sometimes they believed that a wrong decision was better than none at all. That's what Young said. But the police, on the other hand, had to take more time because, and this is a direct quotation, be, the important thing whenever the law is involved is to be right from the start. So that's something to think about, right? So the, the police being representative of the law have got to be, you know, seen to be above board, right? You got to, whoever is arrested, people have got to understand and agree and accept that there's a good reason for it, right? And the other person who was a very important, in my view, to uh, Templar's cause between 1952 and 54 was uh, Alec Peterson or ADC Peterson, who actually served with uh, uh, Admiral Mountbatten in World War II. So Peterson was appointed as a Director General Information Service, or DGIS, by Templar in August 52. So uh, as a result of Peterson's research and the work he did, the British colonial government began to slowly turn things around in an emergency, especially when uh, it was realized in Kuala Lumpur, in King's house, that the most important thing was to deny the MRLA, the hearts and minds of the key community, in this case, the rural Chinese, but how? And this is Peterson's important contribution. He argued in a report to Templar in October 1952 that all of government, not just the Malayan police, but the army, the district officers on the ground, the information services personnel, of course, the, uh, the Chinese affairs officers, anybody in contact with the rural Chinese community from the government had to be more community oriented, more politically sensitized in uh, what Peterson's, you know, his legendary phrase, everybody had to be propaganda minded. That was his phrase, propaganda minded. So very interesting that he, he actually used that term, right? And, you know, some people may think that, well, of course, everybody has to be propaganda minded, right? Uh, well, maybe, uh, well, maybe it's not that obvious because we look at the situation in South Vietnam a decade later, and this is uh, Edward Goodwalk, who's with uh, Center for Strategic International Studies, CSIS. He, he, he analyzed the American uh, experience in South Vietnam, and in this passage, he's rather sardonic, but I think there's a particular truth, kernel of truth to what he was saying. So he was saying that, you know, in, in the case of a village, a South Vietnamese village, right, uh, you know, under uh, stress, right, under threat from the communist uh, Viet Cong, right, uh, the A AID, Agency for International Development People, would come to a village in Vietnam, help it out. The next day, the U.S. Air Force would flatten the village. Then a special forces team would go in and work with the survivors to rebuild the village and train them in self-defense. Next, the artillery would barrage the village. Then a psyops or unit would pass around leaflets and explain the importance of fighting the Viet Cong. Then the Navy would flatten the place with gunfire. Now, this is a bit of an exaggeration, of course, but Ludwig's point was the right hand didn't know what the left hand was doing. So eventually, the villagers don't know, are you our friend or are you our foe? And this is not being propaganda-minded. This is definitely not being propaganda-minded. And this is, I think, the key point, right? And you know, you when you look at current conflicts, right? You 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 wonder whether or not, uh, in terms of counterinsurgency lessons, uh, lessons of the Malayan emergency have been learned. I mean, uh, minimum force, you know, is it still something which is uh, seen as relevant, right? I mean, the drone strikes have. Uh, I I being, being somebody who studies terrorism as well, I can say that you know the drone strikes, for example, have helped to radicalize populations. So to conclude. Uh, I think Malayan emergency offers us many lessons, but I'll offer three here for discussion. Number one, I think not only what we say, but equally what we do constitutes propaganda for both good or ill. Number two, I think the one key lesson or takeaway of the emergency is that an integrated propaganda-minded approach was ultimately the key to ultimate, ultimately consummating the successful British-Malayan counterinsurgency effort against the communist insurrection during the first emergency in Malaya, right, 1948 to 60, it was a, it was they, they, I think they understood by 1952 to 54 onwards how to fight propaganda-minded counterinsurgency campaign, right? And it's and one thing I'll probably leave it up there for for discussion is I think the propaganda-minded coin strategy that evolved in Malaya is arguably still of some relevance today, right? So that's all. And of course, I'll leave you with Santayana. Those who do not learn history will be doomed to repeat it. But I'll just stop there. Thanks, Ref. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Kumar. Uh, that was an excellent presentation. I think you captured 
a number of the uh, very key points about Gerald Templer and Malay in particular, and brought it right up today. You know, and I think the comparison you offered with uh, particularly the American conflict in Afghanistan, I think, is uh, one that was repeatedly made. Um, and I don't know that there's much evidence that the lessons ever were translated across, but it was certainly a major point of reference, I know, for American forces. Um, let me turn it straight over uh, to Assistant Professor Ong Wei Chong. Wei Chong, over to you. Wei Chong, I'm afraid you're muted. Hi, uh, can you hear me and more importantly, see my presentation slides? We can do both of those things, thank you. Okay, thanks Ralph. All right, um, so I would like to start off by thanking uh, Mike Kotner, uh, a close friend whom I, I've known for a very long time in reaching out to me to, uh, to, to speak on the subject. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is to really continue the conversation from where Kumar left off, uh, because what I'm going to do is really look at the Malay emergency as well as the so-called second emergency uh, and the CPM insurgency writ large uh, by using the lens of the long durée. So what do I mean by that? Uh, so in this case, what I'm trying to do is to really look at the enduring impact of the CPM emergency on Malaysia as a nation state, uh, as well as its national psyche, as well as transitions from colonial to post-colonial, from colonial to post-colonial counterinsurgency, and thereafter any sort of uh, insights for contemporary counterinsurgency, if any. Right. So I think some of you would be very familiar with this uh, image, uh, which is the national monument in KL. So as you can see, you have the security troopers sort of standing over the um, uh, the the bodies of insurgents so you know you can see why in 1974 the the, the CPM did attempt to block the national monument so 1974 that was really the peak of uh, the CPM violence during the so-called second emergency era so hence uh, what I'm trying to do here is to really uh, ask this question. The, so when we look at the uh, CPM-inspired insurgency in the Malayan Peninsula from, 50, from uh, I would say, 48 to 89, although here I'm used 52 because that was where there was a significant shift in strategy, its enduring legacy uh, in 20th century Malaysia, as well as uh, some of the more enduring implications for today. Okay, um, so this is the scope of my presentation in, in the 20 minutes that I have, it's, it's really as follows, right? So uh, I'm gonna sort of build on what Kumar talked about earlier in uh, his presentation on the legacy of Templar, as well as the Malay emergency paradigm for conflict insurgency practice. I'll look at transitions in the CPM insurgency from 52 to 89, uh, the complexities of transnational cross-border insurgency, uh, the role of negotiations in ending the CPM insurgency because in 89, what happened was uh, there was a, a peace treaty signed between the, the CPM, uh, the government of Thailand, and uh, the government of Malaysia. And I would really like to focus on this because I think this is something which um, has sort of been a major lacuna in looking at the CPM insurgency as well as insurgencies writ large, uh, which is the role of negotiators in ending insurgencies and building an enduring peace. So in a nutshell, this is uh, going to be the, the scope of my presentation. So back to the earlier, uh, back to the point of, 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 of today's uh, webinar, which is the legacy of Templar. So I think one of the enduring legacy is the many emergency uh, the colonial period, especially, as sort of a paradigm and template uh, for contemporary 21st century counterinsurgency. So I think that there is an issue with that. First, because uh, there is this idea that the uh, that, that that there is a a, a sort of a, an approach in, in this regard, the British approach to current insurgency, which might be superior to the uh, American approach. So we see this in in. In, in, in the works of 
uh, Robert Thompson, like Kuma mentioned, uh, uh, brought up in, in, his, in, his in his presentation, where there is this sort of contrasting between uh, British counterinsurgency practice and American counterinsurgency practice, and you know somehow there's this idea that the British approach is superior. Uh, and I, I think this 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 is a myth that that really needs to be uh, questioned because here um, you know you are actually sort of projecting backwards to sort of justify contemporary policies as well as counter insurgency and uh, uh, that, that there's there's this sort of uh, projecting backwards to justify contemporary policies as well as counter insurgency doctrine. Um, and what tends to happen is that when we sort of set the success story of the Malay emergency as a paradigm, we tend to overlook certain phases and transitions in this period. So I'm going to treat this as sort of, you know, in, 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 in a large package, the entire legacy uh, of, of, of not only the Mer Malay emergency, but also Templar in trying to uh, sort of project backwards to justify uh, with serious consequences, uh, I will present this lens on uh, 21st century counterinsurgency. So I think when we look at this, uh, uh, and Kumar sort of highlighted this earlier, um, at the outbreak of the uh, emergency in 1948, uh, the, the uh, authorities and the government, they weren't really terribly prepared, right? They failed to anticipate and they were really, really unprepared for uh, the outbreak of the shooting war. But as we saw from the transition from uh, um, through the various high commissioners from Briggs to Templar, um, the government, the authorities, the military and the security services, they actually adapted, uh, you know, Kumar talked about the, the principle of minimum force, uh, as well as, uh, you know, several measures taken uh, through the various security agencies, as well as the use of air power. Like, for example, uh, you know, they, they sort of found that type of bombing the jungle wasn't terribly useful. And so they deployed uh, aircraft, the Lancaster bombers, strategic bombers for uh, psyops and uh, strategic communications, right? So that's an example of adaptation. Um, and here, I think it's also useful to, to look at how uh, military organizations uh, adapt and learn. So you have different uh, books on this that actually, I think, sort of feed to the myth of this idea of how uh, British counterinsurgency learning is superior. And the example that I'm talking about is John Nagel's Learning, learning to Eat Soup with a Knife, right? Um, but I, I think one has to be careful about how such lessons or influence uh, gets transferred. And also this idea about whether it's merely institutional awareness or is there a view transfer of best practices uh, in counter insurgency. I think uh, this is where we need to be sort of uh, more aware of the different phases uh, in, 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 as well as the different approaches taken by, for example, the different high commissioners uh, and having a more accurate understanding of different phases. Uh, I, I, and what I'm trying to say is that, uh, you know, this idea of, uh, the Malay emergency and the legacy of Templar as, as, as sort of being the go-to sort of re, uh, repository for experience as well as learning for counterinsurgency has to be sort of uh, treated with caution over here. Okay, um, so um, let me sort of provide a little bit of uh, context uh, when I talk about the transitions of the CPM insurgency in the Malay emergency period, vis-a-vis -vis that of the second emergency, which is very much the period where uh, I'm more comfortable with because that's where, uh, you know, where I've published and that's the bulk of my research really. Um, so I think one other big myth about the CPM as well as the MRLA is that they had extensive external support, uh, especially from the CCP. So um, in this case, in the case of the second emergency, what the CPM had was very much fraternal support, right? Support in spirit rather than material. So um, that, that, that is something which uh, I think some scholars of, of the, the, the CPM got wrong, that they actually had uh, significant CCP support. So this wasn't really the case until the second emergency, which I'll uh, delve into later. Um, and also Kumar talked about the uh, October 51 directives. Uh, this is where, you know, there was this 
realization that um, possibly they had lost a shooting war and there was a directive to withdraw into the deep jungles of Malaya, especially the, the central highlands that you see over here, right? Cameron Highlands, the, uh, the, uh, the dark gray shaded uh, portion on the map. Um, so uh, I'm sure some of you would be very familiar with the um, Hack Ramakrishna debate. I, I had a chance to look at the participants list and there was a Carl there. So I don't know whether it's Carl Hack. Carl, if you're here, uh, big, big shout out to you. So I, I think, uh, you know, the, the, despite where, where they sort of disagree, I think more or less what Carl and Kumar sort of agree on is that uh, the back of the CPM insurgency, especially the military effort of the CPM, uh, particularly that of the armed wing, the MRLA, had very much been broken by 1950 to 52, right? Uh, and so when we look at the various attempts, especially by the CPM to set up uh, as a lush, uh, as a last ditch effort, a headquarters deep in the Central Highlands, namely Cameron Highlands, they failed, right? So what Jinping did in 1942 was to uh, put up, to, to issue a directive for a phase withdrawal to Southern Thailand. In 1958, um, they actually had this put away the flags and silence the drum directive, which essentially is a very strong signal of giving up the shooting war and sort of uh, reconsolidating in Southern Thailand. Um, so again, um, here, you, you, this, this is uh, extracted from uh, the, the interview which Carl and CC Chin uh, and Professor Wang Gongwu had with uh, Chimping at the ANU, I believe, in 1999. So it's published in a book, Dialogues with Chimping. And Chimping admitted that uh, they had no other way to go. They had to move across the border into southern Thailand. Uh, it was not a plan. It was not their plan. And, but they were forced by circumstances to move one step another further north and further into southern Thailand. Um, and so this was very much uh, what the CPM did. Uh, and, and here um, I have the, um, the, the map of uh, the, 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 the disposition of the CPM fighting units. Uh, and in 1970 to 1974, the CPM actually had a split. Uh, and so as you can see from the map, uh, they, they had uh, three different factions, CPM main, CPM marxist Leninist, CPM uh, reform faction, uh, and they had their own fighting units. So um, the, the plan was that from 62 to 68, they would consolidate, uh, rebuild the forces, and uh, when they're ready, uh, they would launch a southward advance back into uh, the Malay, Malay Peninsula proper. Right. So as you can see over here, they have uh, different AUs or regiments, and uh, each A and regiment, the, uh, the the size varies from 200 to 600, right? So uh, the idea was to infiltrate uh, back into um, Ma Malaysia back then, uh, because you know, as as we know, uh, Mal Malaysia uh, gained its independence uh, in, um, in 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 1958, uh, and this is where uh, you know the um, the the, the, the story of the second emergency really start because with the independence of um, Malaysia, uh, an independent Malaysia uh, had to take on responsibility for its own security effort. Uh, so um, I, I think it's, it's worth noting here that uh, Malaysia actually had two different communist insurgencies that they had to deal with. One, that of the CPM uh, in the Malay Peninsula and the other in Borneo, which is that of the NKCP or North Kalimantan Communist Parties. And the army, unlike the, the figures which uh, you saw earlier by Kuma, where uh, you know, the Commonwealth Security Forces could count at the peak of uh, hundreds of thousands of security personnel. In this case, uh, the Malaysian army had only two divisions as well as that of the, uh, the, the PFF or the police fuel force to, to uh, take on the brunt of the uh, counterinsurgency effort in the second emergency. Um, so I, I think it, it's useful here to sort of uh, briefly explain the consolidation as well as the, the, the strategy of the CPM uh, in, 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 in this sort of, uh, in, 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 the, in the greater scheme to uh, infiltrate Malaysia and seize power. 
Um, so from 68, I'm sorry, from 61 to 68, the CPM Central Committee um, was exfiltrated to Beijing. Uh, they actually sort of uh, had their, their, their Politburo, the Central Committee, uh, ensconced in, uh, in Zhongnanhai, which is like the posh bit of Beijing. Uh, and at CPM base, is, 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 uh, they are cadres in Singapore as well as uh, in some parts of Malaysia, they withdrew to Indonesia, and from Indonesia, they were actually redeployed to southern Thailand. Uh, and, and in order to do this, they, um, they actually set up a underground support network to facilitate the exfiltration of the cadres to southern Thailand. But uh, it, it must be remembered that the key aim here is to use southern Thailand as sort of a safe base uh, to ultimately uh, infiltrate back into Malaysia and then uh, possibly uh, seize, seize Malaysia through uh, revolution. Uh, so from 62 to 68, they were really laying the groundwork for uh, their uh, resurrected re revolution. And, and so here we actually see the active recruitment of Thai Chinese uh, who are living in southern Thailand, namely in the Betong and Sadao area, as well as uh, the Malays in Narakiwa. Um, and, and so here, the, they, they really sort of um, had the advantage of being able to set up a state within a state in southern Thailand. Because it must be remembered here that uh, in this, during this period, um, the writ of the central government in Bangkok was actually weak. There wasn't really much of a government presence nor security presence in southern Thailand. So what the CPM could do was make use of this vacuum to create a state within a state. Um, you know, they could like uh, recruit the Thai Chinese, uh, recruit the local Malays, as well as targeted whatever KMT elements that were in southern Thailand. So as you can see, there is this sort of uh, transnational network in southern Thailand that allowed the CPM to sort of rebuild and ultimately uh, resurrect the arm insurgency in 1968. So 1968, that was when they thought that they were ready. Uh, and that, that is where they, um, um, you know, renewed their insurgency in, 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 from Southern Thailand into Malaysia. Um, and going back to my earlier point about this idea uh, of uh, CCP or uh, this notion of CCP support. Now, in the second emergency, this was where they actually received uh, crucial external support from, uh, from the CCP as well as, as Communist China. Uh, it wasn't just fraternal, there was a lot of material ex, um, assistance. So uh, like I mentioned earlier, um, the, the Politburo, the Central Committee, uh, they, uh, the, the bulk of them, the key decision makers, uh, is, is included back uh, by that by the 1960s, he was not in Malaysia or southern Thailand, but in Beijing, far from where the action is. Um, and also, the Chinese um, assisted the CPM in setting up a broadcast station, the Voice of Malayan Revolution, which was. Um, uh, which, which was cited in Huran, China. Uh, so it's, it's for subversion. Uh, they, they had radio broadcasts that could be heard uh, in Malaysia, Singapore. Uh, and when uh, the S Singaporean authorities tried to jam the signal, uh, they found out that they weren't terribly successful in, in, in doing so. Um, and also in, in the second emergency, what was different from the emergency is that uh, the CPM could rely on external support, not just from the CCP, but also the other uh, fraternal uh, communist parties in Southeast Asia. So for example, uh, the, the, the CPT or the Communist Party of Thailand provided medical training uh, to, the, to, the, to the Marxist-Leninist faction. Uh, and Lerdoan um, actually offered the CPM captured US weapons as an if, a big if, if they had the uh, logistics to sort of transfer the weapons. But unfortunately, the CPM did not really have a Navy or a maritime component, so they couldn't really uh, you know, move the, the weapons from uh, Indochina to Malaya. Um, and another key transition or departure from the second emergency as compared to the first is that rather than a 
insurgency in the heartlands of, of peninsular Malaysia, what you have here is a cross-border insurgency. So what it means is that it is incredibly difficult to resolve by unilateral military means alone. So in order for security operations to be successful, the Malaysians had to work hand in hand with the Thais. Uh, and I would argue that the principal achievement of the Malaysian security forces here is uh, not really in cross-border rates, but ensuring that the development projects, namely Kasban development projects, uh, were successful in uh, Northern Malaysia. So I think this is really the key contribution, the key principal achievement of the uh, Malaysian security forces. So the Kasban Belt, it's, it's a development belt that stretches from the state of Perlis to Kelantan in Northern Malaysia. Uh, it covered about uh, 358 square miles. Uh, and between 1981 to 1990, um, a total of 78, 786 projects were implemented. And these projects uh, turned what used to be black areas dominated by the CPM into a thriving development zone. Uh, so, you know, if you sort of drive from Singapore, the, uh, from Singapore and you take a north-south, the, the north-south highway uh, from Johor all the way to Malaysia, you really see the enduring legacy, uh, you know, the new villages that, that, that Kuma was talking about. Um, you know, they, they, they are thriving towns today. So uh, as compared to, for example, uh, what Kuma mentioned earlier about how uh, the new villages Templars emphasis that, you know, they shouldn't be seen as concentration camps. I think this is really much uh, uh, the, the proof of the pudding, where uh, you know the new villages. If you sort of travel from Malaysia all the way to uh, the northern states in Malaysia today, and you sort of uh, visit them uh, across the North South Highway, they are actually thriving communities. They they are uh, towns with a uh, a, a self sustaining social economic system, uh, which is rather, rather different from uh, a concentration camp, um, and. Going back to my earlier point about the difficulty of uh, cross-border insurgency. So um, it, it really takes two hands to clap over here. Um, and one crucial development was the recognition by the Thais that the CPM uh, posed a threat to the security of Southern Thailand. And so this is where there was some movement in setting up a regional border committee in 1965. And this sort of progressed to a border cooperation agreement in 1970. So this actually allowed security forces, both Thai and Malaysian security forces from both countries to actually cross the border for joint operations in hot pursuit, which obviously can be contentious even up to today, right? When we, when we think about cross-border uh, operations. Um, so they, they had major points of agreement uh, they define what the common enemy is, as well as the development of command and control, as well as SOPs for future joint operations. So this was a major development uh, that enabled effective uh, joint operations along the border. Uh, so uh, in 1977, there was an agreement uh, to actually set up a combined task force command uh, with representatives from both the Malaysian and Thai side. Um, and it, it's really very much the CTF level that uh, coordinated operations, uh, joint operations uh, for the Malaysians and the Thais, right? So, you know, if uh, there was sort of any, any necessity for cross-border operations, this would be uh, dealt with at the CTF level. Um, so now I would like to talk about uh, the prospects of, of the success of uh, the CPM's resurrected uh, insurgency. So when we look at how, when we look at a larger international situation, you know, it, it, it seemed like the opportune moment, right? Um, you know, communist parties were gaining power in the 60s and 70s in Indochina. So, you know, it, along that backdrop, you, you can sort of uh, forgive the CPM that they think it's really the right moment for them to resurrect the armed struggle. Obviously, they also had uh, a considerable support uh, from the C CCP. But why were, they why were they defeated if the conditions seem right for uh, their renewed um, struggle? 
Um, and here I would like to raise um, three main points to account for their failure. One is that when we look at the actors of the conflict, uh, local, regional, and international, as the insurgency went from 68 to 89, especially in the 1970s, um, there was a development that sort of uh, disadvantaged the CPM. First, there, there was a split uh, from 70 to 74, where they were split into three different factions, three different factions. So, you know, they were actually com competing one another uh, for, for, for support as well as recruitment. Um, and also in, in the 1970s, uh, with, with the death of Mao, uh, 1978 in particular, and Deng Xiaoping assuming the leadership of uh, the paramount leader, you actually see a shift in Chinese foreign policy. Well, because here you actually have Deng uh, realizing that it's much better for uh, the People's Republic to win over ASEAN support um, in, in both countering um, the Soviet Union as well as uh, support for, for, for the Chinese position in Indochina as compared to, for example, supporting the CCP. So uh, in the 1980s, uh, Deng Xiaoping was actually sort of persuaded by Singapore's founding Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew to close down the VMR station in Hunan, China. Um, and, and if we look at the, the support of the CPM in Northern Malaya, uh, they couldn't really address this major problem, which actually stemmed from the emergency era that they were largely seen as uh, a Chinese dominated movement that doesn't really represent the interests of the rural Malays. And I think this is a fundamental problem for the CPM, which they failed to address because if you look at the demographics of the Northern Malaysian states, Kelantan, uh, 1972, overwhelmingly Malay, Tringaro, 92%, uh, police 78. So they can't really convince the rural Malays uh, that the CPM was actually uh, on their side. Uh, and also, they, they made a series of wrong strategic choices um, in the 1970s. Uh, so here you have um, the, the, the image uh, taken from the bombing of the, um, the National Monument in KL in 1974. Um, the, the, the CPM, they also assassinated uh, the Inspector General Police of Malaysia. But the peak of the violence doesn't really mean uh, that the, the, the CPM was actually making headway in Malaysia. Uh, because like I said, because of the split within the party and the, the move uh, in, or the emphasis on the gun rather than uh, political action was a wrong strategy made by the, the CPM in the 1970s. Uh, because they really, really insisted uh, or uh, they were very firm in the belief that armed revolution was the only path uh, to success. So uh, I'm now going to talk about negotiations, which is also uh, the final slide and the conclusion, as well as sort of um, ask certain questions about whether um, the road to a negotiated peace uh, could actually present certain useful lessons for today. So we know that in 1955, um, Attempts at talks failed. That was in Bali, right? Uh, because the am amnesty terms were, accept were unacceptable to the CPM. In contrast, in the second emergency and, and, uh, and as, as well as the resulting peace agreement in Hat Yai that led to uh, the, the CPM uh, transiting from an arm, arm movement to uh, a, a non-violent struggle. Uh, because you know when we look at Hat Yai, uh, it's very clear. Uh, there wasn't any terms that, that, that required the CPM to disband as a political party. So the CPM does exist today, but as we know, you know they, they, they are no longer a political force. So when we look at Hat Yai, there wasn't any harsh conditions that explicitly lay down uh, in very harsh terms that the CPM must disband as a political party. So how, how did we get there? So I think it was really a learning experience uh, for all involved uh, involved in the negotiations. So it start, the, the, the road to peace started in 1985 and it sort of began with um, the low hanging fruit, the, the initial contacts made by uh, junior officers. Uh, in this case, General Arkanet, 
whom I had the pleasure to interview for, for my um, research on the second emergency. Um, so, so what happened was, um, General Akane, obviously, uh, I, when, when I sort of asked him this, this question of like, what led you to the road to peace as well as taking the option of the pathway of negotiation, I, I think he shared with me uh, back at that point in time, he was a, um, a, a, a ground officer, um, Lieutenant Colonel, and he was wondering, uh, or he was pondering on the he was pondering on the question that uh, when when you when when you look at the the strategic situation, it was it was clear that the CPM could not really win. Uh, but at but as as an officer, as a ground officer, um, he was still taking casualties. Right, uh, men were, were were still being wounded uh, by, by by booby traps. Um, and so tactically, tactically, um, the security forces they 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 were taking casualties. But how do you sort of break the deadlock? So I think that was when he started uh, putting out feelers to commanders of his level on seeing if there could be any prospects for negotiation for negotiation. And uh, this sort of led to sort of a buy-in from uh, his um, his army group commander when there, there were some reasonable prospects for success. Um, so here, this is really a case whereby um, it was really small steps, taking baby steps, exploiting windows of, of opportunity and exploiting early success. Um, and what the Thais did was uh, before the peace agreement was signed with the CPM main faction, uh, they actually sort of signed an earlier peace agreement with a the smaller split, uh, splitist faction. Um, and, and so here, I think one important lesson to take away for, for negotiations is that uh, it is always important to build on early success before you sort of sort of you know go for for for, for the big league um so here like i said uh, you actually had uh Akanet actually sort of reaching out uh to the ground level commanders and sort of subsequently building on to negotiating with the splitters faction of the cpm and ultimately uh negotiating with the cpm main itself so here uh, there were certain feelers put out that uh the cpm main they will be willing to disarm to lay down your arms if an agreement could be reached. And, and it's also important to note that uh, on the Malaysian side, the Malaysian Special Branch or MSB, the, the sort of successor of, of Special Branch in Malaya, uh, they actually proceeded with negotiations under the radar of their military colleagues. So the, the military or the Malaysian armed forces, they were actually brought in much later into the conversation on the peace agreement, really really in the late 80s when the, the agreement was really close to being sewn up. So here you actually have the MSB negotiators avoiding the imposition of the harsh terms that we saw earlier in Baling, which were unacceptable to the CPM, such as the surrender of weapons and the dissolution of the party. Um, and, and here, I, I can't put it any in, in, in better words, but here I'm going to sort of uh, draw on uh, an interview with uh, Tanshu Rahim Noor, uh, who's, who's the former director of Special Branch uh, in Malaysia and subsequently IGP. Uh, so in his words, uh, this can happen, uh, by, by that he meant the negotiations as well as the road to a negotiated peace in Hat Yai. This can happen because you were not involved in the fighting, unlike the MEF. And if you were, probably different because in so because so many military chaps killed, so how to do peace. If MSB in 1988 had adopted 30 to 40% of the Malaysian attitude in December 1955, it will be finished. So in the words of Tanshi Rahim, no, you know, because he was literally director special branch, uh, he was appointed, uh, I believe in, in, in 86, he could really take a fresh approach, uh, unburdened by uh, the, the baggage, the legacy of that of his uh, predecessors. So with that, uh, I'm going to... I, I, I would like to sort of leave these sort of thoughts on the road to negotiate to a uh, 
for consideration in, in terms of counterinsurgency practice of today, drawing from the obviously the historical insights of the second emergency. So uh, thank you for your patience and attention, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, for that, Wei Chong. Uh, fascinating presentation, an excellent compliment, I think, to Kumar's uh, a wonderful presentation beforehand. Um, the audience have done exactly as I requested at the outset, notwithstanding my technical issues, which has fed questions in already. So we've already got a great bunch of questions that are starting to come in, but I'll mention again, audience, if you do want to ask a question, please feed it in. And then the other thing I'd say to you is actually one of the joys of the Zoom Q&A function is you can, uh, you can approve or like answers or like questions, and that will actually bump them up the ranking. And if I see a question which lots of people are ticking, I will ask that one over some of the others. Um, <clears throat> two very practical questions which have come up, which I'll put to our speakers, but probably are not ones to answer right now, but to follow up on. First is people are asking, they would love to see your PowerPoints. Um, so I guess we'll follow up afterwards if you're happy to share the PowerPoints that you had with the audience. Um, if people want it, people I think can write to Connor and, and request it. Um, and the other is uh, a couple of people asked for um, a book, uh, bibliographies. If you have any good books that you would recommend that cover the military aspects in particular of the emergency and the fighting in the jungle. Again, these are not necessarily ones you want to answer now, unless there's a specific book you say, oh, well, this one has to be covered and please go ahead and read it. Um, but it's maybe one to consider. And I think people can contact afterwards and follow up on that. But another question, which we've seen a number of people ask, because you both kind of talked in some ways, I mean, Kumar maybe less explicitly, well, actually, you know, you did bring it right up there as well, but uh, uh, certainly Wei Chong, you talked about a lot, the comparison with COIN and counterinsurgency today and sort of what we're seeing back then. But a lot of people ask, well, what has been the impact of this on modern Malaysia? Um, and what has been the impact of these strategies that we saw back in the 50s and then all the way through to what uh, uh, Wei Chong, you were talking about in the 80s, what has been the impact of these campaigns and these strategies and Sir Gerald Templar's actions on modern Malaysia. Um, and I wonder if we could start with that question. It's quite a big, broad one, but I think, you know, you both talked a lot on the sort of military side, the counterinsurgency side, but what about Malaysia itself? How did what we saw happen in the campaigns you talked about impact what's going on today in the country? And let me start with Kumar. Yep, thanks, uh, Raf. Uh, it's a good, broad question. I mean, the Malayan, I mean, uh, there's an American uh, novelist, William Faulkner, who says that the past is not gone. Uh, the past is not dead. It's, it's, it's not gone. It's still here. It's affecting all of us, right? So you can really, I mean, modern Malaysia, at least in terms of the uh, political setup, uh, very much uh, bears the, the imprint on emergency. Uh, Wei Chong mentioned the, many of the new villagers uh, have now become thriving towns, you know. So uh, that that very much uh, uh, is something you can see uh, outside Kuala Lumpur, uh, Pateling Jaya, which is a, a very uh, major uh, district outside Kuala Lumpur. Use it started out as a new village, you know. So uh, Subang Jaya as well. So it's it's there. I mean the in terms of the the, the geograph uh, the configuration the built up nature of uh, Malaysia today those are the political uh, uh, configuration there I mean there have been changes of course down the decades uh, I would say that arguably that after 1969 when you had the 13 May 69 riots uh, when Tunku Abdul Rahman who played a, such a big role in the emergency it was at, he was at the Baling talks in 1955 and he when he stepped down uh that was uh, the beginning of a perhaps a uh, relatively more conservative turn in malaysian politics yeah but that's uh you know that's what i was i was, I, was, I think i'll stop there because it's a really big topic in itself yeah yeah no thank you uh, and i think you're starting with a Faulkner quote is always an excellent way to answer such a question uh wei chong over to you so i think um i sort of hinted this in my presentation about the malaysian um coin doctrine of Kesban and also IDEF, which is very much, if you look look at the, the, the core principles, which is very much the security forces um, actually providing the security umbrella for development to take place. Uh, essentially, that sort of harkens back to the uh, Malayan emergency era. Obviously, the institutions as well as 
uh, the the sort of actual development projects that take place would uh, have changed through time. But essentially, this, I would argue, remains a core principle of the role of security forces in dealing with uh, insurgencies as well as national security uh, in, in general. So you have the, the military acting in support of national security as well as um, civil authority. So I think that as uh, a, a, a fundamental principle, it is something that we, we still see today. Uh, and, and this has evolved in, in, into, uh, for example, uh, the, the actual practice that Malaysia took to end uh, the, the CPA insurgency in 89, um, as well as the, the NKCP insurgency in 1990, as well as it really, fun, I think it's a fundamental influence uh, in terms of uh, tradition, as well as mindset uh, in the Malaysian Armed Forces of today and their role in uh, security operations. So I think this is very, very much uh, a, a legacy that, that endures today, uh, which is which, which is a good thing, right? When we think about uh, the role of security forces in dealing with, um, with with insurgency, as well as the larger questions of what military forces military forces should do. Thanks, Wei Chong. Um, we've had a couple of questions which are quite specifically directed at Kumar. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask one of those now, and then I'm also going to bring in another question, which I think goes to both of you. Um, and Kumar, if you want to tackle one that's specific to yourself and then the other one um, as well, and then uh, I'll pass it back to Wei Chong. The first one is, is for Mike Codner, who uh, Wei Chong mentioned and is, of course, hugely instrumental in, I think, this entire series, uh, a longstanding uh, member of RUSI. Um, and he asks... Uh, did the Tanjong, this is for Kumar specifically, did the Tanjong Malim incident have any effect on Templar's actions? And he asked this because his uncle, Michael Codner, um, was uh, killed as a district officer. And he was, of course, uh, a famous figure uh, from uh, the famous uh, Wooden Horse uh, incident at Stalag Luft III in, in the Second World War. So that's a, a specific question to Kumar. And then a question to both of you is, you know, what was the difference between the first insurgency and the second insurgency peace processes between opposing forces. So I wonder maybe there's a sort of compare and contrast and maybe you can each draw on your respective presentations uh, uh, to sort of answer that one. So first, Kumar, over to you. Sure, thanks. Uh, yeah, Tanjung Malim in 1952 uh, was one of the uh, first uh, exercises in a collective punishment which uh, Templar oversaw, uh, which, I would say uh, it was part of his uh, evolution in terms of his thinking about how to deal with the insurgency. He arrived in February 1952. So I would say that uh, he spent, I would say about the first year trying to get a sense, appreciation of the situation strategically and operationally. And he understood that uh, in order to defeat the, the communist insurgents, you needed information. Information was the lifeblood, right? intelligence information. The problem which uh, the authorities faced on the ground was nobody was speaking because they were terrified. I mean, the, the army, the police would come in the day, the communists would come by night. So it's, uh, from the point of view, the villagers, certainly in Tanjung Malim, it was a question of being caught between a rock and a hard place, or so what do you do? So Operation Question was uh, an exercise which was introduced first in Tanjung Malim in 1952, where essentially Templar was experimenting, was saying that, okay, during the curfew, okay, the, the Tanjung Malim, the incident uh, where, uh, uh, Cotner uh, was uh, killed uh, along with other people. Uh, they were put, Tajo Malim was put under a 22 hour curfew because no information was forthcoming, right? Uh, so Templar went there and he was basically trying to get uh, the villagers to sort of like provide information on who was supporting the communists. So Operation Question was an uh, exercise where the, the um, during the curfew itself, opportunity was given to the villagers to provide information, write down the names of people who were supporting the communists on pieces of paper. Nobody will know where the pieces of paper were coming from. Uh, eventually, right, I mean, uh, this did provide some information, but ultimately as Templar evolved in his thinking, as he talked to more people, he was especially talking to the uh, district officers, uh, the, uh, the other uh, officers who were involved 
in direct contact with the, the villagers, he realized that the first thing he had to do really was to improve the overall climate. So, and the overall climate at that time, 1950, well, 49, 48, 49, until 52, 53, was that the rural Chinese constituency, with Tanjung Malim was part of that, just didn't like the government, right? They, they didn't really trust them. They didn't trust the communists, but they did, that didn't mean they trusted the government. So the government had to do something to win the confidence of the people, particularly the rural Chinese constituency, including your, uh, your Tanjung Malims, right? So, so what Templar did ultimately, which to me really turned the tide around, was that he got rid of all these oppressive uh, regulations, uh, collective punishment, uh, uh, collective detention, deportation. Uh, and, and he. this is why I say the, the propaganda aspect of the emergency is very important because Templar was very alive to this. I mean, he's the guy that was saying that, you know, don't call them resettlement areas, call them new villages. Why? Because we want to give them, a, give the villagers the sense that the government is actually trying to do something for you. In fact, at that time, the MCA, the Malayan Chinese Association, when they saw what Templar was doing, they, they actually said, well, this is an interesting form of propaganda. The term they used was, this is materialistic propaganda. So it suggests to me that they understood what Templar was trying to do. Improve your life, right? Okay, we made mistakes in the earlier days when you know we, we hastily resettled the villagers away from the jungle fringe so as to increase the distance between the CPM, guerrillas, MRLA, and the villagers. But okay, we didn't really think about uh, where we resettled the people. I mean, they had to get rid, I mean, they had to leave their farms, right? And then they had to, and you know, we, we had to think about uh, how to improve their economic opportunities by, for example, properly citing them near the bigger town so there's some op economic opportunities or site them, site the villages uh, where there's land, they can grow stuff, right? So a lot of these things in the early days of the emergency, nobody actually thought through. When Templar came, he got his guys to start thinking about, okay, you know, when we talk about resettlement, it's not just uh, operational uh, thing. Of course, we have to, uh, you know, split the link between the guerrillas and uh, the people, but we also have to do something for the people. We got to get them to talk to us, right? So these are some of the things which eventually evolve, starting with uh, Tanjung Mali. I'll stop there. Yeah. Thanks, um, Sorry, wait, on, go on. <clears throat> so, so the question on peace negotiations, I think it is something that I'm still trying to uh, unravel myself. Like what went wrong in Bali? Uh, and the, the 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 sort of I think one one of the continuities which I see from Baling to uh, Hat Yai in terms of the negotiation uh, is that in by the time when uh, the different parties met at a table in Baling, um, Tongku was already certain that. Militarily, the CPM was beat. In, in fact, uh, here Kumar, feel free to come in that he was so confident that they actually sort of fast forward the, the independence of Malaya, right? Because of Tonku's confidence of that, you know, the CPM insurgency would would soon be over. Uh, and I think this this is also something which we we we, we see as um as the backdrop for the uh the later inclusion of the Malaysian Armed Forces in, in the negotiation. So this is something which I did not mention in my presentation, but um, so we, when we sort of fast forward from, from uh, the 1940s to the late 1980s, the Malaysian Armed Forces, they were also pretty confident that the CPM were defeated militarily. But here, uh, this is where you had the Malaysian negotiators coming from special branch and not the armed forces. The armed forces were only brought in much later, right? Because um, here you actually have the possibility of a, a negotiator from the MAF possibly not being able to uh, appreciate the nuances, the, sensit the, the, the certain sensitivities uh, of, for example, the special branch negotiator, which is very much a deep expert on the CPM. Right, so I, I've also managed to interview uh, Dr. Yao, who is the lead MSB negotiator. 
uh, he he's someone going back to uh, you know I really had time to sort of go in in in, in like, like what Kumar did in, in, into uh, the experts which the special branch brought in, but they really had the best guy for the job who understood the CPM on their own terms, uh, and this is I, I think this is where MSB uh, had a better appreciation than, for example, the the, the armed forces because for the armed forces. Uh, they, they they were pretty certain that militarily that the CPM can't uh, can't win. So why would they want to negotiate? But you know, I mentioned earlier, General Akanet, he was military, he was a military man, but he was a ground commander, and he knew that yes, um, strategically the CPM can't really win. But nonetheless, um, the, the, the 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 battalion that he was he was leading, uh, they they were taking casualties in the jungle. So you know, when at at personal level, when you are losing men on the ground, uh, you tend to see things differently from, for example, senior commanders who possibly does not that do not really have that that uh, appreciation of ground realities. But but this is just uh, my thing. I think Carl has joined the conversation. Yeah. If Carl has joined the conversation. Uh, sure. Uh, if I may add add to what uh, Richard was saying, in 1955, right? Uh, by 1955, the CPM uh, knew that uh, they were on the back foot uh, operationally. They, they, they were not going to achieve their aims. So they were trying to extract whatever they could, uh, a, a suitable political uh, settlement to, to sort of like secure uh, what they could from the jaws of defeat, right? So essentially at 955, uh, Chinping, the Secretary General, he wanted to secure from Tunku Abdul Rahman uh, political recognition of the party. So it was so from Tunku's point of view and uh, the British uh, supporters of Tunku, that's a no-no because like if you do that, it's like uh, what happened to whatever the CPM had done since 1948, right? All those atrocities and all that. You can't just, you know, close one eye and forget about all of that. So uh, Tunku refused. We're not going to recognize CPM. Instead, you, you guys... Are going to lay down arms. Going to uh, you're going to uh, right, be subject yourselves to investigations, uh, you know, and that kind of thing. So Jinping refused, and the Baling talks collapsed, right? So that was one of the the key reasons why uh, the Baling talks collapsed, and the CPM sort of like uh, switched strategy, and instead of like uh, trying to uh, secure political recognition and participate in the political process in Malaya, they sort of switch uh, attention to Singapore. Right, because from the CPM's point of view, Singapore and Malaya were always seen as a strategic unity, a geopolitical strategic unity. So if you don't succeed in Malaya, you go to the island of Singapore and vice versa. Right? So that's why from 1954 onwards, uh, Singapore was seen as uh, a more likely uh, place where the CPM, through political subversion of the trade unions or the students' associations or uh, penetration of left-wing political parties, they could succeed. So... You can, I mean, the CPM will always, like all the communist parties, will say that, you know, on the one hand, on the, on the, on the one hand, you have an armed struggle. On the other hand, you have united front tactics. So they were pretty consistent uh, in that sense. Yep, I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, and also, um, maybe I would just like to sort of add in a bit over here. So when we look at the peace process in Hadia, it was actually a pretty long road. It started from 1985 to 89. Uh, and the thing about Hadia is that there were sort of, successors, the low hanging fruit, which I talk about that they could build on. Uh, and this wasn't really the case in Baling. They, they couldn't really build on initial success. So I think Baling, it, it was really difficult to take off because you know there, there wasn't really that, that that's the same conditions, like for example, in Hat Yai, where you know, uh, the, the groundwork was laid at the low level, uh, they, they went for the low hanging fruits uh, and they slowly sort of built on uh, local success. Ultimate, they ultimately led to uh, negotiations with with with, with CPM main. Um, so so here I think it's it, I think as as historians, uh, we are very well aware of uh, contingency of agency and all the different moving parts that has to come together uh, to to make something like that work. So so I think um, I I don't really want to be very, very prescriptive in, in, in providing a clear-cut answer. But I, I think uh, for Hard AI, it just so happens that um, when, when we look at, for example, 
uh, how, for example, you know, MSB had the right guy for the job. Uh, even in southern Thailand, you, you had a ground commander who realized that uh, it is is more than just a shooting war. Uh, there has to be uh, other options, including uh, negotiations. Uh, you actually had you know you actually have to have a good boss, right, to empower you to make things happen. Uh, that came with Arcanid senior commander uh, uh, General Kitty, um, and 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 on the Malaysian side, uh, you actually had the Prime Minister. Um, Mahate, as well as the Home Affairs Minister, she was holding a dual appointment at that point in time to actually agree to direct the special branch. And he ensured that, okay, you know, special branch, uh, you can do this and I'll make sure that uh, the, the rest of the guys, uh, uh, you know, the rest of the security agencies, uh, they, uh, they, they don't, you know, they, they're still pretty much um, in the dark over there because that's a good reason, right? Uh, because they, they, you had to ensure uh, the, the, the right conditions for MS, MS, MSB to... Uh, you know, start negotiations on, on, on the right footing. So you need all these different uh, conditions to enable the, the success in hard AI. And I think a lot of these elements were, were, were sort of um, missing in, in Baling. But obviously, you know, uh, these are very good questions. And, and as I sort of develop my research further on this, um, I would sort of kind of like, you know, um, update, uh, you know, up, update, um, you know, all those who are interested uh, in, in, in the next journal article or something along those lines. Uh, and as for the, the question that, uh, or the request, which uh, Raf mentioned earlier on the uh, bibliography of sources, actually I had something, I will just share my screen and let me know if you can see it, uh, is actually, just give me a minute, Maybe Wei Chung, I'd suggest if you have a link to, uh, do you want to put a hyperlink into the chat instead? It might be an easier way of sure. doing it than, uh, I think, it, so if you check into the, I think if, if if the audience look in the chat function, you'll see there's been some very useful and interesting commentary by some other members of the audience. And I think that also, you know, Wei Chung's now put in there a link for uh, uh, this particular book, which I think would be quite useful uh, for people to read. Um, I'm conscious that we've actually got a lot of, uh, other questions still out there, but I'm also very conscious that we are coming up right towards the end of our really interesting session. And I know there's a lot more, I think, that we could say about this, but I'm probably going to uh, offer our two speakers uh, maybe one minute uh, to briefly conclude if they have any final point that they would like to quickly make to the audience about uh, the Malaysian emergency and what's particularly salient uh, about it today. Um, if you can do that in one minute, and then I'll offer some very brief remarks about the next session that's going to happen in this series for Rusi. So, uh, Kumar, over to you. If you have any final oh. thoughts you want to leave with the audience. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, thanks, Raf. Uh, the only thing I'll, I'll just want to reiterate is that uh, I think the emergency, uh, I'll talk about the first emergency and General Templar's role, is still very much a, a very relevant case study, which um, I believe holds uh, lessons for, you know, for today in terms of counterinsurgency. I think I, I would agree with uh, what Robert Thompson used to say that uh, ultimately it is important to sort of, uh, in modern counterinsurgency, you need to defeat the political subversion. It's not just uh, targeting the insurgents, the combatants. You got to look at the infrastructure supporting the combatants and you need to go after that. You got to like drain the swamp. So I think there's still a, a timeless uh, uh, axiom, which I think is still very relevant today. Thank you. Thanks for that, Kuma. And I thought, as I was looking at both your presentations in particular, a lot of the terminology that was being used at the time, I recall from the discussions around Afghanistan over the past 20 years. Um, Wei Chong, over to you. Yeah, so I think, um, thanks, Raf, for like, you know, mentioning the, the, the A-word Afghanistan. So I think, uh, back to my earlier point about, you know, some of the overlook uh, process when we, when we think about counterinsurgency, I think negotiations is very much the key. So how do we sort of... Uh, avoid the unraveling of the negotiation process that, that we saw uh, in relation to Afghanistan. So I think this is really my, my, my one minute remark that, that if I have to make, it is this, right? <clears throat> we can't overlook this. Uh, it is more than just um, the, the other aspects, uh, development, the role of security forces that, that, that have sort of been like the front and center when we think about uh, successful countries counterinsurgency policy or doctrine. And I think the role of negotiations, it, it, it is something that is often overlooked. And if it is something that is not done well, we're going to be 
ending up with forever wars. Yeah, so that is really that that one minute uh, spiel that I want to make. So you know, if we don't get the negotiations, the negotiated peace, right, we're going to end up having more forever wars when we try to end insurgencies. Thank you, Wei Chong. A very sobering, but I think very relevant uh, point to end us on. So let me thank both Kumar and Wei Chong for being such excellent presenters, such patient presenters as well, uh, given their chairs technical issues at the beginning, but it's been really a wonderful discussion. And thank you very much. And thank you to our audience for, I think, offering some really interesting points. And I can only apologize that we didn't have enough time to get to all of the really interesting questions and points that were raised. And I'd encourage people to use these last few minutes to have a look at some of those questions and have a look at the chat function, because some really interesting points were raised there, which I think add and enrich the discussion. Um, this, you know, if we're in ordinary men, we would all now rapturously applaud our speakers, um, but we unfortunately are not. So all we can do is thank them from a, a distance. Um, but I want to briefly say that the next webinar in this series, uh, the military history series run by Rusi, is scheduled for the 3rd of March, um, which is going to be at four o'clock UK time. And the speaker will be Professor Beatrice Heuser of the University of Glasgow, who will be talking about the Anglo-Spanish War. Britannia's first attempts to rule the waves, uh, which will look at when and how did Britannia begin to aspire to rule the waves, um, and focusing in particular on the Anglo-Spanish War of 1585 to 1604. So another really excellent and rich uh, history military discussion, which I'm sure we can all look forward to. But without further ado, let me thank everyone. Um, and uh, to those out here in Asia, uh, enjoy your dinner. And to those of you back in Europe, uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you very much.